Hi there. In this topic video, we're going to be looking at public goods and private goods. This is a really key topic for year one microeconomics. There's a lot to get through, so let's make a start. Public goods are essentially collective consumption goods. And public goods cause market failure due to the problem of missing markets. In other words, the private sector may in part or in whole fail to provide essential public goods. Now, public goods have three main key characteristics. Indeed, they're the opposite of private goods and services. The first characteristic is non-excludability. And this means that the benefits derived from a pure public good cannot be confined solely to those who have paid for it. Indeed, non-payers can actually enjoy the benefits of consumption as well, at no cost to themselves. And we call that the free rider problem. The second characteristic of a public good is non-rival consumption. And what this means is that consumption by one person does not restrict the uh, consumption available by somebody else. In other words, the marginal cost of supplying a public good is zero. If you supply a public good to one person, you make it available to all. Non-rival consumption. The third characteristic is non-rejectability. The collective supply of a public good means that people can't reject it. And a good example of this is a national nuclear defence system or perhaps a major significant regional flood defence project. So public goods are non-excludable, non-rivaling consumption and non-rejectable, whereas private goods are excludable, rivaling consumption and rejectable. The key problem with public goods is it's extremely hard to protect property rights and use those to make a profit. And this is a, an important reason why the private sector does not provide public goods. So we've looked at the main characteristics of public goods. The two most important ones probably are that they're non-excludable and non-rival. So here's a few examples of public goods. Sanitation infrastructure provides a public good aspect to the whole community. So too, and this has been highly topical of course in recent months, are flood defences or tidal barrages providing collective consumption products. Peace of mind from having an effective police force is a public good. And so too is the spillover effect affecting the entire population from having sufficient number of people vaccinated against particular diseases. In today's world of new technology, masses of information and courses are made freely available, non-excludably and uh, non-rivaling consumption. For example, massive open online courses or MOOCs. So the spread of online learning could be seen as a public good. And public service broadcasting. For example, the BBC's World Service, I think is also a really good example of a, of a, of a service that is essentially a public good. Public goods are collective consumption goods. Quite a few students think that healthcare is a public good. And in truth, it isn't. And the reason is because healthcare has some of the characteristics of a private good. First of all, it's rival. One person having an operation means there's less resources for somebody else in a given time period. And secondly, of course, it's possible to exclude people who are not willing or able to pay. For example, the spread of private health insurance. So healthcare belongs probably more uh, relevantly in the in orbit of a, of a merit good rather than a public good. Just a word on quasi or quasi public goods are slightly different. So these are what's called near public goods. In other words, they have some, perhaps many, but not all the characteristics of a pure public good. So quasi public goods are semi non rival. That means that up to a point, uh, consumers, for example, using a beach or a, or a park or a major road, now they don't reduce the space or the utility available for others, but eventually uh, beaches and roads become crowded. Wi-Fi networks become uh, crowded with users and the speed slows down and therefore the benefits are, are affected. So quasi-public goods become semi-non-rival at peak times. 
and quasi public goods are semi non excludable. So, for example, it could be possible to charge people to use a park for a run on a Saturday morning or charge people to use uh, a football pitch in a local park. Toll booths can be uh, used on, on roads and bridges. So these are quasi-public goods. They are essentially public good in nature, but they don't quite meet all the characteristics needed to become a pure public good. The key really in Year One Micro is to make the connections between public goods and market failure. Let's have a look at some points here. OK, with public goods, the private sector essentially may fail to supply the optimum quantity of public goods from society's point of view. Pure public goods, in fact, are not normally provided at all by the private sector because they'd find it extremely hard to make a profit. And so therefore the government provides them collective consumption goods and it's up to the state to decide what output of public goods is necessary and how they should be funded. So the government will bring into play what's called a cost benefit analysis, trying to estimate the benefits and costs of a given provision of public goods over time. The free rider problem, of course, is important. Because public goods are non-excludable, it's very difficult to charge people from benefiting once it becomes available. So this is an important idea the free rider problem, it leads to an under provision of a public good from society's point of view. And this actually causes the market failure. New technology uh, is changing the nature of public and private goods. Here are just one or two examples. So for example, encryption devices allow now suppliers to exclude the non-payers, even if a product itself pay-per-view, for example, is actually non-rival. Encryption. Uh, for example, technological progress is reducing the cost of smart metering. So we'll see in more years, presumably, more pay-as-you-go road systems and toll booths, etc. It just means the cost of excluding the non-payers is coming down. And uh, you may be familiar with the open source Creative Commons movement. Um, products such as Flickr, Commons, Open Commons licenses. Essentially, this is making information available on the web extremely open. Public good in nature. So, should the state provide public goods? Here's a classic exam question. Comment on the case for an increase in government spending on public goods. We know that the state finances many public and merit goods but it should always provide them. Well, the non-rival nature of consumption does indeed provide quite a strong case for the state to, uh, to provide and pay public goods. Many public goods actually are provided free at the point of use and then funded by a tax or a levy, such as the BBC's licence fee. The state providing directly and not necessarily charging at the point of use, may help to prevent under-provision and under-consumption of public goods. And the long-run effect of that could be that we improve our overall social welfare. Another argument is that if the government provides public goods, they may actually be more efficient than the private sector, particularly if they can benefit from economies of scale, from providing these goods to millions of people. Providing essential public goods, possibly free at the point of use, also helps affordability and access issues, particularly for families who are, whose budgets are stretched and who simply cannot afford to access many services. The other point, of course, is the government becomes a monopoly provider of public goods. There's a counter argument, and that is that there could be a lack of efficiency resulting from a lack of competition. So perhaps the private sector might be better off providing the public goods for example, building and maintaining a road network, even if the government eventually funds it. In some cases, we see this happening. In some examples, the state will fund and then the private sector provides public goods, for example, through what's called public-private partnerships, although these themselves, in many cases, have proved to be quite controversial, particularly in the building of new schools and hospitals.
So we've looked at public and private goods today. I think the key thing really is to make, uh, is to understand the key characteristics of public goods. Non-rival in consumption, non-excludable. And then think about the economic and social arguments for the state providing essential public goods. More resources on our website every, every single day. Check out our YouTube channel for some more year one micro videos. Thanks for joining us today. See you sometime soon.